Today on Mild vs. Wild, I've got $15,000. And I've got $25,000. And we're both building 6.7 liter Cummins engines. So we're here in Terre Haute, Indiana to visit Shy Diesel. Hey guys, we're here today in Terre Haute, Indiana to visit with Shide Diesel and shop owner Dan Shide. Shide Diesel was founded in 1982 with only five employees here in Terre Haute. In 1990, the shop opened a second location in Effingham, Illinois, and nine years later, the Lafayette location opened its doors. All three locations have a fuel injection shop as well as a dedicated drive-in service area. In the more than 40 years since Shide Diesel was founded, the shop has grown from just five to more than 50 employees today between the three locations. Shy Diesel can service any diesel engine, including but not limited to agricultural, construction, heavy duty truck, and automotive. Shy Diesel has also made its mark in the diesel performance market with tractor and pickup truck pulling, as well as diesel drag racing. And that's why we're excited to be at Shy today to talk about a pair of 6.7 liter Cummins builds. Again, our mild budget is $15,000 and our wild budget is $25,000, which should both make for awesome 6.7 liter builds. Once we break down what goes into each build, we'll compare them for dollars per horsepower, competitiveness, drivability, reliability, and ease of upgrading to see what build comes out on top. All right, guys, well, that's enough of us talking. Let's go see Shy Diesel and talk with Dan Shy. All right, guys, here we are in the lobby of Shy Diesel, and I'm with a man that really does not need an introduction. Dan Scheid. Dan, thanks so much for uh, having us uh, in the shop here today. We're excited yes, to discuss a couple of these six, seven Cummins builds with you on both the mild and the wild side. Um, but, you know, Eric and I were talking on the way down. Neither of us have, have been to the shop. Obviously, we've chatted with you at events and, and seen mm -hmm. you at races uh, over the years, but haven't gotten to be in the shop yet and uh, would love to get a tour and, and show the viewers a little bit about what you got going on here at the Terre Haute location. Yep, that'd be fine. We can okay. go ahead back to the shop here and uh, I'll show you around. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. This is our diesel fuel injection um, department here then and we uh, we work on pumps, injectors, and turbochargers, and we started in this building in 1982. And uh, Joe Hackman, who's our service manager here for the diesel fuel injection side of things, so uh, we can turn it over to Joe, and awesome. he can kind of show you around a little bit there then, and kind of show Joe, you. Joe, yeah, different... nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So this is this is where it all began, huh? Yeah, this is where it all began. Very so, cool. Like I said, this is the heart of all the diesels we. Pretty much got to make all the fuel run, you know, or the engines run with the fuel injection. So that's yeah. what makes it happen. Huh? That's what makes it happen. Yeah. So. Joe, how long have you been here at the shop? Uh, 37 years. Oh, wow. Okay. So just about since the beginning. Huh? Yeah, yeah, almost. So very cool. Yeah. So, like I said, we got our common rail stand here that we run common rail injectors with. And uh, on the common rail fuel side, you know, we do that testing and a little bit of rebuilding there. Okay. and everything and then we got pop testers over there for the mechanical injectors and our test stands and stuff are over there you know the guys rebuild stuff here you know this is pretty much our pop testers basic stuff here that we got for just popping mechanical injectors yeah and then uh and we got our test stands we're running a lot, mainly all the mechanical stuff, and then we got the electronic stuff, you know, like VP 44s for okay. 98 302 Dodges. Yeah. Um, we do some common rail uh, CP3 pumps. We can run them on either stand there if we needed to. Do have a Huey test stand over there um, that we can test Huey injectors, like for the power strokes, the older power strokes. Okay. We use that stand there for that. Yeah. Um, there's some of these old military stand like this one here we use for mainly like model 100s off the internationals things like that so you get you get a lot of business though people just bringing their injectors or their pumps to you we do um, we do a lot of you know farm equipment stuff you know um, do a lot of that plus the high performance side of it too mm -hmm. so we do quite a bit 
on both, you know, both sides. So pretty much anything that's diesel, right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Some of the big, real big stuff anymore, we can't, you know, we don't really have the equipment to do it. With some of that we got to send off to our centrals, but other than that, we yeah. can usually handle most of about anything, so. Awesome. Oh, wow. So here awesome. we have our uh, drive-in service area here then, where we Very work cool. on the uh, vehicles and um, we have, uh, Greg Jolly here then is our drive-in service manager. So hey Greg. he can show us around a little I'm also bit. Greg. Then, <laughs> yeah. Very cool. No, this is a nice space. This is our drive-in shop area. I mean, as you can see, we've got a vast uh, variety of equipment out here. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, your newer trucks with maybe some emissions problems, uh, injectors issues, uh, all the way back to keeping the old 6.5 on the road. Oh, or wow. Old cab over back there getting an overhaul, so we do a, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, we also over here, if you want to follow me, we have our DPF cleaning room, where we're able to uh, take some DPFs off the machines and pneumatically clean them, uh, help keeping these newer trucks on the road. Okay. Uh, help save you know thousands of dollars if yeah. we can. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of these things are three four thousand dollars and we can get them in and cleaned up for under a thousand it's beneficial to everybody how long does uh does that process take uh the whole process takes uh, a few hours uh we'll okay. bring them in here uh basically you pen test them see make sure there's no oil contamination no burning where things have kind of gone haywire on the truck after that they'll put them in the pneumatic blaster kind of cleans everything pressurized air uh, blows out all the soot and ash and then if it's okay from there we put it back in service. If it still needs yeah. to go, then we obviously have a kiln over here to okay. superheat everything and yeah. then go best, basically repeat the process until we can get it as clean as possible okay. before putting it back on a vehicle. Very good. A lot That's of these it. are more like your, uh, your utility companies where trucks are sitting idling for numerous hours. Yeah. Uh, that's where you see most of these failures happening. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, makes sense. That's neat. Yeah. Hey, you don't see that every day, right? Yeah, no, right. Very, very few. <laughs> cool. So Dan, back out here, you know, I was sure. curious. Um, you guys have, you know, five, six trucks in at the moment. You know, how many mm -hmm. trucks can you have in the driving service area at once? We're, we're getting pretty close, getting pretty close. Um, you know, we got room for a couple more, um, but right now we've got a few big projects. Obviously we got an engine replacement here for a city bus. We've got the yeah. uh, overhead going on the cab over. And obviously you guys are, are well known for the Cummins platform. Mm -hmm. Is that primarily what you guys are doing in here or do you guys get other? It goes other in deals? waves. Yeah. It goes in waves. We see a, a wave of Cummins and we'll see a wave of Fords. So okay. it's not one thing over the other. Yeah. Okay. So, but, so you guys will tackle whatever, oh yeah. whatever's we'll, coming We'll tackle in. whatever we got. We yeah. got uh, old tractors over there. Yep. So a little bit of everything. Yeah. Great. So Dan, when did you build this drive-in shop here? Uh, it was completed in 2018, so it's it's relatively new. This is our um, third addition here to the complex here at Terre Haute. Okay, this is a beautiful shop. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Well, appreciate yeah, you. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Greg. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right. Here's the machine shop. Yeah. So um, here we have the machine shop there then, and um, so. Uh, at this time, I can kind of turn it over to Todd. He's our machine shop manager, and uh, uh, he can go ahead and show you around there then Very on cool. uh, hey, Todd, uh, the equipment hey, we nice have. Nice to meet you. Todd, there. Nice to meet you. Good, good to have yeah. you. So you're in charge of this uh, whole Well, process, when he so. lets me, yeah. That's pretty much how it goes. I've been with Dan. Uh, he's let me be here about 19 years. So. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Very I lean good. a lot on Jared Jones. Uh, okay. Jared Jones helps us out a lot over here in the reman facility. Yeah. And uh, if I could show you guys some of that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Hey, Jared. Good hey, to see you again. You. Yeah, yeah. Jared. All right. Yeah, I'll follow your lead. Show us. All right. right. Let's let's run over here. All right. He's got a couple of rattlers. Yeah. Yep. Sure. So what we've got here is we've got basic reman, but we also do our own billet head work over here on these machines. Okay. Um, I'll have Jared take you through a little bit of our reman program. Yep. So I'll show you what we did in these. This is a 6.7 liter cylinder head. So it'll be yeah. uh, 2007 to current. 
it's a 19 actually until they turn into the hydraulic engine. So, anywho, we do uh, like high press seat into them and then we do uh, these plugs right here like to rust out on certain applications. Mm -hmm. So we try to stay ahead of those and we put actual pipe plugs in. And then on the spring side, we'll end up threading these holes as well. Yeah. You don't want to have a uh, flood failure under the valve cover until your crankcase will cool it. And then the customer is not going to know that's happening. Right. They're an engine up pretty quick doing that. So right. Those are preventions that we try to do in our, into our uh, three man programs. Okay. To uh, ensure the customer is going to have a good product. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yes. And uh, in some of our performance heads, we, we run the uh, 110 SPI spring. Okay. So that's a, a good feature. The SPI came out. Not too long ago, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty recent, yeah. And then we can run the, uh, I don't know if you saw in the other segment there that was uh, coated valves and stuff like that. So yeah. we'll run those as well. Okay. Uh, into the high performance applications, that's if a customer wants wants that application or not. Yeah. And we, we'll run SBI stock, stock stat. And, uh, yeah. Just over the road stuff. So. Right, right. Very good. You guys have been happy with that, that product and using all that stuff? Yes, yeah. yes. It's been very consistent. Uh, spring pressures have always been consistent on the spring tester itself. And, uh, usually their, their grinds and their size of their valve stems have been very, very consistent. Yeah. One of the ten. So nice. So that makes makes my world easier when I am fitting and finishing things. Yeah. And I, I don't have to really, really, really check all that stuff real hard. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Uh, so uh one of the things we do here at Shy Diesel is we got to get the fuel in there, right? So yeah. as we're building horsepower, a lot of times it comes down to fuel. So we have to manage that with our uh, injection system. And here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but we have to change the spray angles in the engine. This is a C-Series billet head we produced a few years back, and this customer needs some uh, different angles, but some different pistons, different bore, uh, uh, piston cup bore. Yeah. So we'll have to modify piston, um, for the new piston, okay. so these angles here, uh, we're developing those as we go and we'll EDM those out. EDM is electrical discharge machining. I don't know if you're familiar with that much, but we use a spark on materials that are too hard to drill. Okay. And then we can extrude hone that afterwards to smooth that finish up or whatever we need to do. And so this is so, this is kind of like a model that you guys have set up for spray angles and right, things like that? Right, That's right, cool. so we'll okay. have to develop, uh, we'll, we'll look at this, analyze it, and we'll change the angles accordingly to what the customer needs to try to get the most horsepower and then we'll yeah. dyno prove it yeah you know it doesn't matter what our best guess is if it doesn't make numbers on a dyno right right so, that's very cool so is that uh is that angle you know that injection angle is that related directly to the piston in the combustion chamber yes all of it it's oh, really nice. we've found we found horsepower in just as much as rotating rotating this assembly not really even changing the angles on this but actually just rotating it a little bit we found horsepower so when you get uh, in the higher horsepower application everything matters uh, fuel delivery has to be superb with the air that we're getting and the way the valves open um, makes a certain swirl or tumble in the system so if the head is being modified by someone a lot of times they'll come back in and we'll need to modify the uh, modify the uh, injector tips for that new tumbler swirl that's happening. So taking holes that are maybe 10 thousandths up to 30 thousandths is what we do. Yeah. Okay. And also manufacturing um, holders along with that too for different applications and for different types of cylinder heads, we are actually manufacturing the holders to hold the nozzles as well to where that we can fit that application on the special needs on them, whether it be common rail or mechanical fuel injection. This is a production mule for us, this Miano. And as you can see here, it's uh, dropping off our uh, delivery valve holders. This go in the top of the P7100 pump. And uh, he's got the program down to, you know, spit those out very efficiently. Uh, it comes over here and we do all our inspection and gauging uh, according to, you know, our certs and what we need to. And here you can see some of the cams, uh, you know, that are out of the machine and uh, that was the first stop. And then now has he told you he was setting up on the second op. So that's what we're looking at here. Did you have any questions about that? 
Well, so Todd and, and Dan, you know, obviously you guys have other shop locations that do different things. So, you know, the machine shop here is it, it's more focused on the fuel side of things versus, you know, the full engine side of stuff. Well, we uh, we can go a little bit further with it to yeah. some of the other machines. So okay. we're actually manufacturing cylinder heads and intakes and valve covers and uh, dry sump oil pans and okay. uh, a lot of other features of the of the uh, billet engines uh, along with that. And uh, we also do some uh, uh, manufacturing there then for the performance side of the fuel injection on the mechanical uh, injection, like uh, modifying gears and. Uh, uh, harmonic balancers and uh, anything that touches the motors yeah. got the possibilities for some improvements. So right, right. Uh, we try to catch in on all of that. Okay. But then I, I do understand that the Effingham location does a lot of machine work down there too, right? Well, the Effingham location, uh, they are set up uh, basically about like what we are, but the okay. machine shop side of it is basically done here in Terre Haute. Okay. And uh, so over there, they're building uh, more of the common rail uh, injector stuff, okay. and uh, they are doing most of the builds on the engines at that location. And then gotcha. um, at Lafayette, um, we uh, are still doing the drive-in work and the fuel injection work. Uh, we've just got one tech at, uh, at the uh, Lafayette location. And then we also have uh, a location in Attica, and uh, that's where we do a lot of the, the high-end builds on uh, uh, on the performance engines there then. Uh, Kent Crowder is the manager there. And uh, we also have a 4,000 plus horsepower flywheel dyno there then. So oh, that's wow. where we do our testing at okay. uh, on the dyno then. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Guys, see, I, I didn't know all that. Uh, yeah. That, you know, most of the couple of the shops are set up very similar and do some, do yeah. a whole bunch of different work. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. Yeah. So that gives us the opportunity then to trade off a lot of times too. If uh, yeah. one shop doesn't have the ability to do it, then we can swap, change shops and go to the other shop and uh, we might be able to get it out a little faster or have that product on hand ready to go. Right, right. Well, if you if you pan down here, you can see some of our, uh, some of our work from billet to somewhat finished product. This is, there's some years of uh, development happening here. Uh, Dan can probably tell you more about that piece over there that that he and Jared uh, took apart at one time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was our very first aluminum block that we uh, that we purchased there then, and uh, uh, that's uh, an LSM block, and um, it's also water jetted as well. So um, our it's a water cooled block. Uh, can be water cooled. We wasn't running it water cooled, but. Um, as you can see, um, uh, we probably had about 300 passes on it at that particular time, and it actually split the block yeah. and uh, lifted it off to the side of the dragster, and he's running about 160 mile an hour wow. at that time, and it was hanging on. So the turbos and the cylinder head yeah. was all laying to the side. And uh, so it was good that it didn't get under the tire or anything, because right. we could have really had a catastrophe then. For sure. Uh, but uh, so anyway, uh, we have beefed up the blocks since then and made them a little thicker and we really haven't had any other failures with them. Yeah. And uh, and that one paid for itself by all means. It, yeah. uh, well, it, it makes done for a, good a job cool for display it. now, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is what can happen. Yeah, and, uh, wow. Uh, so now then, whenever we're drag racing, we also run straps around the motor there then so that if by some chance that does happen, at least that will help yeah. keep it contained yeah. on the engine. And we run straps on the on the pulling engines as well, to where that uh, uh, that we can kind of keep everything contained. Because yeah. if they blow out, they'll they can actually end up on the ground and run over it. Then you got a real right. mess on your hands. Right. So well, and then you know from that point we started a billet block program here and uh, purchased the Centroid 560 for that. Right. And we've, we've morphed that program uh, and we have the you know billet intakes as uh, Dan was wanting more air and wanting to do more with our air. Um, we we're able to take actually that chunk there and build this billet intake out of it. So that's what it starts as. And, yeah. and this right here, this lower assembly is what it becomes. 
even now, Dan has a, Dan and Jared, the dragster team have a, a new request and we're building another one of those with different modifications up on porting uh, presently. So that's yeah. going to be on the machine probably this week. Okay. And it's, uh, it's always cool to me, like what it starts out as a big chunk of metal and then, you know, you lose so much weight in oh, the final yeah. product. You know? Well, and you're able, we we had weldments for years, right? And, and weldments with aluminum, uh, they really fatigue and those cracks can fatigue out and you can end up and have some issues with that. So going to that billet, it is more costly on the front side, but our goal is that our customer is gonna see the longevity and the quality uh, for more than one season right. and not have to dip back in and touch up welds, right? Because safety becomes a factor when you're boosting things 200 pounds, you know, yeah. those, uh, I've coined the phrase around here where it seems like we're trying to build horsepowers and hold togethers all at the same time. And that's one of the, two, the items we use to build those hold togethers yeah. uh, for for the team. Yeah. So. Very cool. And then here you've got a, you know, this kind of started out here and yeah. this is a billet aluminum program um, where we're, we've got 24 valve and 12 valve billet, billet aluminum heads that are being manufactured. You can. You can see on the machine right up there, there's one being machined presently. Yeah. So I you can get some, get some your eyes that. on the prize in there, yeah. seeing it happening for real. All right, so I've talked to you guys a little bit about, uh, Jared talked to you about our reman program and our reman heads and, and how we uh, go through those. Whenever we're going through and making a reman head, we always keep in mind that guy's gonna, gonna probably want some horsepower. So we put them on the shelf without the firings really being done in them. And that way the person calls, they want firings, they don't want firings. Compared to their uh, application, we're able to make that adjustment on the fly, get it done for the customer and get it out. So what, what Logan has here on the machine is uh, one of those heads. I, this is the 110 pound SBI head. Uh, it's got the, it's a 24 valve with the spring, six, seven. And uh, this will be firing as you're here today. You'll probably see it done over on the table later. All right, well, uh, the only other uh, machine shop item that uh, I have then would be the line room. That's kind of housed under uh, the umbrella of me. Uh, and uh, we can go up to the line room and maybe look at that. All right, sounds great. Okay. Okay, in this area here then, we have our um, line bending room and uh, where we make up different styles of lines. Uh, Todd is uh, also, this is his department as well. So uh, uh, I'll turn it on to Todd there then to where that he can uh, show you around here a little bit and uh, exactly what we're doing in this area. Well, thanks guys. Thanks for coming up to our line room. Uh, this has been a, a labor of love for quite a few years here at Shide being the uh, supplier for aftermarket fuel lines. And, and you know, it kind of came about, uh, Dan's been supplying fuel lines manually bent for years for his farm customer, construction customer, you know, all those in between. And uh, people that are making a living on their diesels needed fuel lines. They're like spark plug wires, they wear out, you know. So um, Dan's been meeting that need. And then it kind of came to a point where we needed a little more. Uh, the market desired more product and more options in the product, not just the individual who was making a living with it, but that individual who was performing with it in, uh, uh, in performance points. You know, those are things that needs to happen. So they needed a little more uh, fuel line volume, things like that, more fuel. And then, uh, so behind us, you can see that uh, we've made quite an investment in stocking lines and um, each one of these lines are, you know, for different applications. We have common rail lines to, to uh, mechanical injection lines, uh, inline pump lines, rotary lines, uh, all, all, of, all the things in between. Uh, we stock the more common things. Uh, there's some things that we don't stock uh, and those items are made per sample or we've been given uh, uh, Don, uh, Don over here, I want to introduce you to him. Don's been able to uh, use as much as just a coat hanger pattern uh, to, to make a, a line out. So uh, we've had to do quite a few different things to bridge the gap for our customers. Well, real quick guys, this wall over here are manual bend patterns. So uh, 
There's only a certain amount of lines, like I said, that we can do on our uh, CNC bender, you'll see in a moment. These types of lines, of, there's years of uh, patterns that are on this wall that takes an uh, individual like Don, um, has to have some artistry, right? There's a, there's a craft here. And so that's why we give them tools or inspection fixtures such as the actual engines. Uh, you'll see we have here final fit engines. These engines here will allow, even though there's patterns coming off a, a CNC or there's patterns being manually bent, we'll be able to uh, put them on the engine or the application that they're going on and make sure that customer gets a decent or a good final fit, right? So you remember downstairs, I talked to you about the Miano machine being a real workhorse for us. Yeah. Uh, so as you see here, we stock thousands and thousands of our we build thousands and thousands of our own product for our informs. These are going to be everything from uh, ferrules or, uh, you know, to the, the nuts, yeah. uh, different thread pitches, different applications. Right. Um, we have to manufacture all that in-house so that we don't have a huge issue with uh, product flow and meeting our customer needs. One of the things we've had to do over time is bring more in-house so we can control more on being able to have product. Mm -hmm. Our lead time, I'll show you over here on our fuel line. <clears throat> I would say, gentlemen, at this time, this is less than half of our in-stock fuel line. Wow. Really? Um, we have to, we have to navigate better than a year lead time on fuel line. Yeah. Yeah. Really. So by having, um, you know, the foresight to get that, I mean, COVID, taught us all something right yeah so uh we went um, we get some of some of this line uh has coatings done in france well when you shut the whole country down for six months it really makes a dent and a ripple in the whole environment so uh to future proof shy diesel and meet our customers needs uh, dan's really invested in uh, putting a lot of product on the floor in the warehouse so that we can have good product flow. Yeah, yeah, that's important for sure. Yeah, so here we have housed uh, stainless steel lines, um, steel, high pressure tubing. Uh, we go from 62 thousandths, which is the inside diameter, 62 thousandths mm -hmm. for some of your um, smaller applications, uh, up to uh, 140 thousandths for some larger fueling applications. Tyler over here is putting end forms on, things like that. Uh, you know, when you're making up the lines, you got to put the nuts and sleeves and and then put the swedges on so that that's all one piece. Uh, so that doesn't leak on us and makes a good seal. Yeah. So that's what Tyler's over here doing for us. All right. and then I'll bring you all the way full circle back to Don. And he can uh, he can kind of show you what's going on here. So this is going on a rotary VP44 pump okay. um, but you can see how close it gets to some of its mechanics there whenever i'm saying we have to kind of the pattern is what gets from the machine also to the customer yeah. and we still be able to clamp but that's some of the things that we're doing here is uh we have to navigate around that there's some avoidance moves and things that we're able to put in the in the programming of this machine that allows us to to work through it plus the specialty gooseneck tooling and things like that we're able, yeah. to, we're able to kind of reach around for some of those different options this is one of those machines that's like oddly satisfying to watch right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at this time we can uh, head down to the um, um, engine bills yeah. down there talk and about we can, some six seven comments you bet right? All right. okay all right nice good deal step. Okay, we're back in the shop and I'm here with Joe Gasper who does the engine assembly here at Shide Diesel. And Joe, I've got $15,000 to spend. And when we get started on this build, uh, you know, what's my mindset? What are, what are we starting with? Well, I'd say it's all application based. Um, your $15,000 build is gonna be more focused for a daily driver tow vehicle okay yeah and that you know and that's exactly what we're doing what we're looking for here you know we've got a truck i'm just looking for a tow vehicle 
heavy work use, you know, really want this thing to be as bulletproof as possible. Yep. You know, so I can work it really hard. And so when I start thinking about doing this build, you know, am I gonna start with the bottom end first and think, is this gonna handle the kind of power that I wanna? Yeah, we would start with uh, focusing on the bottom end. That's where your uh, longevity is gonna come from. So on all of our builds, whether it's a stock street engine, all the way up to a 3000 horsepower competition engine, all the bearing clearances are measured using sun and tools. Um, ring gap is checked to make sure that we're not uh, butting any rings or getting close to that. Um, piston skirt clearance, everything is checked, whether it's a completely stock engine or a 3000 plus horsepower competition engine. Okay, so for the mild build that we're doing here, and you know, we're towing a big camper we're hauling, is the stock, the crank, the block, the pistons, is, are those components able to handle that, the, you know, the, the type of horsepower increases we wanna Absolutely, at? the stock crank and connecting rods and pistons are, are good all the way up to about a thousand horsepower. Airflow starts to become uh, a part of the equation, you know, when you're above that 550, 600 horsepower range. So that's why we uh, like to do a, a street camshaft. We offer a, a line of uh, cast camshafts that would be used in something like your $15,000 budget build there. And uh, our, our street uh, camshaft is what we would recommend. It's smaller so that uh, it has good characteristics as far as turbo spool and keeping EGTs down for towing. Let's a lot more airflow into the engine to keep those EGTs down and keep those cylinders cooler for sustained grades and things like that when you're towing real heavy. And Okay, so you say the street cam that you offer, it's smaller compared to a high performance racing cam. A high racing performance cam. race cam, yes. Uh, now, how does that compare to the stock cam? Um, it's upgraded duration and lift both. Um, it's not super aggressive. It's about eight degrees more duration on the intake and about 18 on the uh, exhaust and about 40 thousandths more lift. All of that combined together, you know, makes for a good responsive driver, good for turbo spool and keeping those EGTs low. Awesome, now how does that street cam affect the rest of the valve train? Are we gonna be looking at different valve springs? Definitely. Whenever we uh, would do a build like what you're after, we would upgrade to something like an SBI, upgraded uh, valve spring, heavier duty valve seats. Um, one of the big failure components in a 6.7 or 5.9 Cummins common rail head is the valve seat itself. So we um, offer an upgraded service to where they go in and machine out for larger heavy duty valve seats and you know we install better guides and better seals to to keep all of the oil control on the top end where it needs to be now the valves themselves did you are we going to upgrade the valves in know in this case or do the stock valves the stock valves okay? we have really good luck with from cummins the factory valve we don't really see a whole lot of issues with you can also upgrade to like a performance valve, something like what SBI offers in their line of race valves or their high performance line. Um, they offer with like a coating and um, it seems to do really well for keeping longevity wear in the guide and things like that with that coating. Okay. And what about pistons and rings and, and bore? Do you commonly have to overbore these engines just to correct any wear? You know, yeah, in the we cylinders? see taper. And uh, another big thing that we see that's a failure point is broken piston rings. Um, so that's why on 90% of our builds, you know, that are gonna be used in the way that you're talking, towing heavy. We'll go through and we check piston ring gap and set it to a specific specification that we would like to see. Cummins, we feel that their 
ring gap is a little bit tight for some of the factory spec and that could be some of the failure that we see with the factory piston ring and then piston skirt clearance um, on a tow application like this we would leave it at like a stock setting okay and then just adjust piston ring gap okay now is what's a typical overbore if, if there is such a thing for for an engine like this so that that's say you're you're just to clean up the cylinder walls you're talking a, a 20 thousandths overbore a half a millimeter okay and then you know if it needs more the max that we would ever go would be 40 thousandths over okay or, or and as far as the pistons since we know a stock piston can handle you know the the horsepower that you know we're looking for for the application we're doing is is that is the would a replacement piston in an overboard just be like a stock oversized piston more or less correct okay correct now as far as bearings are concerned are we going to do an upgrade on the bearing is there a type of you know engine bearings you recommend factory cummins bearings or molly clevite um, are two that we use majority of on a street engine or tow engine i wouldn't recommend using a harder bearing like an H bearing from uh, Molly Clevite. Um, like I said, the factory bearing does a wonderful job on that specific application. Is there anything additional that needs to be done or that you know can be done to the cylinder head as far as flow? Or do you find that these stock heads flow really well in conjunction with the street cam? No, the, the stock head does flow really well with that street cam. Um, we do offer porting service um, on your specific application. Probably wouldn't be something that we would need to go after, but if you were wanting to step it up even further, that would be one of the next things that we would recommend is a good ported cylinder head. Okay, so Joe, now let's talk a little bit about more about the fuel system and okay. what's going to be required and what we can you know do for this type of build uh to really you know in, increase you know the performance of this engine well um we use a lot of our own we manufacture injectors here in-house and cp3s as well um we also use companies like sns diesel motorsports um, they offer a full line of CP3s uh, in your specific application. You're wanting around that 5, 550 horsepower range. The stock CP3 would be more than enough. As far as injectors, uh, a set of our 50 horse injectors would be ideal for that 500, 550 horsepower range. Your standard emissions compliant tuning would be paired with those injectors and that would get you right at your 550 horsepower goal and that's keep awesome. things happy. Yeah, that's awesome. So so we're looking, you say 500 to 550 horsepower for this mild build, which is just gonna be awesome for what we're doing and for you know, what we're towing. Now, what kind of durability are we gonna be looking at you know, compared to a stock engine? Are we affecting our durability at all? Are we you know, increasing it, making it more durable? We feel that uh, with the changes that we make in bearing clearance and piston ring gap and fasteners and things that we use from ARP, that it adds to the durability of the engine and the lifespan. Especially if you use a good quality oil like AMS oil or something, that uh, definitely adds to the longevity of the engine. And speaking of the oil, what would be a good weight? Are we gonna be looking at any changes with the viscosity of the oil? Um, normally we stick with a standard 1540, depending upon climate. Um, if you're in a colder region, say Alaska or something, we definitely like a 540 synthetic. Uh, if you're, you know, towing in the desert or across the country, just a standard 1540, standard conventional or like an AMS oil synthetic. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Now, question about exhaust. The stock exhaust manifolds, they flow adequately for this type of performance. And is there anything 
for example, maybe a different muffler or tailpipe that you find that can, you know, allow you to maximize in what we've done here? Oh, definitely. The factory Cummins manifolds being a one piece cast iron, you know, over time of the heat and cool cycles, they definitely are known to crack. So we uh, recommend either like a Steed Speed or a stainless diesel manifold um, just to add for longevity as well as better flow. Like a DPF back exhaust system is always uh, an extra help on keeping things cool and helping with a little bit of sound if that's what you're after. And which is never bad, never nope, bad, right? Definitely not. Uh, you know, talking about keeping things cool, uh, if we're getting a little more horsepower, getting a little more torque out of this engine, we're probably gonna be working it a little bit harder. That's our goal. Uh, what about the, the cooling system on the truck, the radiator, you know, the coolant flow Definitely. overall? Do we need to do some upgrades there? A very common upgrade that we do use is the fleece performance coolant bypass. So on these engines in particular, the way that it's designed, most of the heat is concentrated back in cylinders five and six. Well, with the fleece performance coolant bypass, it actually has a second thermostat in the back cylinders, and it makes it so that the engine maintains a solid temperature front to back. Okay. And then um, every engine that we sell comes with a new Cummins water pump. Anytime you can keep an engine cool, it's going to live longer. It's going to be so a huge benefit. A good upgraded radiator or intercooler is always a good idea. That's awesome. I mean, that's that's we're we're so excited about this mild build. I mean, this thing is going to be great. We can't wait to get this thing in the truck and get out on the road. Uh, can you think of anything else that you know we might think about putting into you know a build like this that would keep us right there in our fifteen thousand dollar price range? Well, one of the biggest things that we recommend is a fire ringed head gasket just to keep the all the combustion gases sealed inside of the cylinder. That is one of the biggest failure points on the 6.7 is the head gasket failure. So you can see on this engine here that we have a head gasket where we machine out the factory fire ring and use 105 thousandths wire and it goes in place here. Okay. And then depending upon the build, we either cut the fire ring groove into the block or into the cylinder head either way. And then that just crushes down in the groove and makes it so that the combustion gases are sealed inside of the fire ring groove, inside of the fire ring itself, instead of out on the fire ring of the gasket. Okay, so even though we're just keeping this on the street and you know we haven't gone crazy this is our mild build by utilizing that fire ring that's just going to make it much more more durable increase the longevity correct and just to just make it a really solid, problem trouble solid free yep. build so joe we've got this engine done and say a couple of years down the road we decide we kind of want to take it to the next level at that point you know, what would we be looking at? Would it be easy to step this up to the next level to increase our power and torque even more? Definitely. Um, like I said in the beginning, you know, this factory engine is probably good somewhere in the 900 to 1,000 horsepower range. And then air and fuel and tuning would be your limiting factors on how much horsepower the engine could produce. So like you had mentioned, an upgraded cylinder head with some porting or a larger injector to get you more fuel and then a larger CP3 to continue to maintain rail pressure and provide the fuel for the larger injector and the tuning. All right, well, once again, uh, you know, we're super excited about this mild build, Joe. We appreciate all the information and you know, we're no gonna problem. get uh, Greg in here now. He's got more money to spend and he's we're really fired up about this. We're gonna get him in here to talk about this wild build. Great. All right, guys, so now it's my turn uh, to chat with Joe here about my wild build. As Eric mentioned, I've got a little bigger budget of $25,000 to spend. And I also have a, a slightly different application here. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna be on the street. I'm looking to, you know, race this thing, you know, have this be a competition type build. Um, 
And you know, you guys have a, a long block here that kind of represents something that you know might be uh, equal to what I'm going to be getting from you guys. Um, so Joe, let's start with some of the machine work and some of those differences uh, that you're going to see in a build like I'm going to get versus what Eric had on the. On Definitely, the side. Um, machine work is all going to be relatively the same. Okay. Um, now on a competition build, we would think more towards. Um, opening up oil clearances a little bit further. Obviously, a uh, piston ring change to something like a total seal gapless. Okay. And then setting the actual ring gap itself quite a bit larger because of all the heat. And then like a main stud instead of just the factory bolt. Okay. In the bottom end. Yeah. And then um, obviously upgraded connecting rods with larger bolts and a uh, stronger forging. Okay. Um, now you talked a little bit about the, maybe some of the machine work on the block. How about on the head? You know, is that a, a completely different head that we're gonna be using versus what what Eric might, might be running? On a competition version, yes. We would be looking more towards a ported cylinder head with the intake shelf removed and you would run like a box style intake, heavier valve springs as well um a coated valve or um an upgraded valve say a titanium or something along those lines okay very good um now you, you mentioned a little bit about some of the components that might be running in this but let, let's run through some of that starting with the bottom end maybe the rotating assembly yep so um, is that still a stock cummins crank in a build like that definitely okay um the stock cummins crank we still use in 99% of our applications. But you mentioned, you mentioned like an upgraded rod bolt and yep. connecting rod. Yep. Um, um, you know, upgraded so what, connecting what rod, like? we would definitely go to something like a Waggler Street Fighter rod okay. or a R, R connecting rod, which is a fully forged rod um, or a billet. Um, they upgrade those to a half inch rod bolt versus the standard comes rod. Okay. And how about uh, with the piston? Any any differences there, upgrades there? That, Definitely. That um, competition engine, you're gonna look towards like a diamond piston with a hard anodized coating. Okay. Um, on the lower end of the competition spectrum, you know, we have good luck with a factory Cummins piston that has a coating on it coat the skirt and then cut the top of the piston for fly cuts for a larger camshaft. Okay. Very good. And you just mentioned the cam, you know, what are my options on the cam? Uh, you know, is that something that can yep. be uh, upgraded? Yep, definitely. We can go to a larger cam or we can even step it up to a roller cam. Okay. And then um, block would obviously have to be machined for a roller lifter depending upon how far you're wanting to, to push it would depend on whether we went with just your standard flat tap at camshaft or went all the way up to a roller cam. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, now moving up to cylinder head, you mentioned that I'm going to have, you know, quite a different cylinder head than what Eric was going to have on his uh, build. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of those differences and some of the valve train differences too. Yep, definitely. So we would upgrade the valve to something with a coated stem or a um, little larger overall diameter of the head. Okay. And then like a performance five angle valve job mm -hmm. matched with a, a port, CNC port job. Okay. Now I know Eric was getting some, some SBI valves or could utilize some SBI valves and springs. Um, you know, I'm on the competition side, but it, you know, am I still able to use some of their performance Definitely. Uh, uh, we would probably use their valve springs. They offer a line of heavier duty valve springs. Okay. Um, they offer, like I said, the, the coated valve as well. Mm -hmm. So we could definitely use their valve train on okay. this application. Very good. Um, now, how about uh, the fueling setup that, that I'm going to run on an engine like this? You want to talk a little bit about some of the pumps and maybe some of the injectors? Definitely. That we need? Um, so, like I said, again, there, air and fuel is going to yeah. determine how much kind of dictates horsepower. Everything, right? <laughs> yep, definitely. Um, 
an upgraded single CP3 or a dual setup would be in the cards and then injector size based on horsepower level. Okay. Um, say 12 or 1500 horsepower, you're looking, you know, at like a 250% over, maybe a little bit bigger than yeah. that yet. Yeah. Now for a $25,000 budget, you know, is it realistic that I get to that 1500 horsepower level? Um, 25,000, you're going to be looking in the thousand to 1200, 1250 okay. type range. Okay. Um, and uh, it could be built for the higher end, but yeah. then, you know, you would need to upgrade to a larger turbo or something along sure, those lines. Sure, sure, sure. And speaking of turbos, so if, I, if I'm realistically going to be in that thousand to 1200 horsepower range, you know, what kind of turbo setup would you recommend running? Is that, is that a large single? You know, is it worth looking at a compound setup? Really depends upon the application. If this okay. is something that you need response, I would stick more towards a set of compounds. Mm -hmm. If you're just flat out drag racing and you're leaving off of a trans brake or something, a large single would do the job just fine. Yeah, okay, very good. Uh, and then how about the oiling setup on something like this? Um, is there any differences between what I would be doing on the competition side versus what Eric might have been doing on that mild build? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, the factory Cummins oil pump, we ran for years and years and years, and all of our competition stuff, our personal trucks and drag race shop dragster that's set several records. Mm. It originally had just a factory Cummins oil pump in it. Yeah. And then as we progressed and we're up into the 3000 horsepower range. You know, we've had to make our way to a belt drive oil system, but yeah. okay. on something like this in the $25,000 budget, no, there would be no need to upgrade to something like that. Okay, very good. And in terms of the actual oil I might be running, you know, I think you recommended Eric might run a 5W40 or a 15W40, depending on kind of where he's at. Yep. Uh, you know, for a race competition application. Competition use only would definitely recommend a 2050. Okay, very good. And and is Amsoil something that would yep. be good to run I definitely there? use okay. like a Dominator or something like that. Yeah. So you're mentioning, you know, it's somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 horsepower is realistic, depending on what I ultimately do with the fuel and air setup. Mm -hmm. um, how about from there? You know, what's kind of the next level up and, and how easy it is, is it to upgrade from, from that level? There again, it's all fuel and air. Once you have the, the base rotating assembly, the factory Cummins crank, we feel is good enough to take you all the way up to around the 2000 horsepower range. Okay. It would ref definitely recommend a good dampener, like a a fluid damper or mm -hmm. an ATI, okay. something along those lines. And then the bottom end would definitely recommend have it balanced with okay. the rods and pistons. And and something like a fluid amper isn't something that I would need at that 1200 horsepower level it's beyond that. We would recommend it. Okay. But anytime you're gonna go for a lot higher RPM, we would recommend that you change over to something yeah. like a fluid damper. Okay. And so beyond beyond fuel and air changes, um, you know, obviously you're talking about turbos and things like that. Is there anything with the cylinder head that would need to be upgraded to kind of make that next jump? A larger valve, okay. we recommend going to the larger valve and then different stage of the porting. Okay. You know, we offer a port that maintains the factory intake shelf and then also offer port job that, you know, we would remove the intake shelf and yeah really get in there and port the okay. intake side real well okay and how about the durability and, and reliability of an engine like this you know obviously the objective is to just beat this thing up and and be competitive out there um but you know you guys did a lot of things to an engine package like this to make sure it does live um you know realistically how durable is, is that engine it should definitely last a season or more okay um as long as you, the end user, is maintaining it, making sure that you are doing oil changes frequently. Mm -hmm. We, on like the pulling side, we change them about every three passes. Okay. So 
If this was like a drag racing application, probably every two events maybe would recommend changing the oil. Good oil, good filter, making sure that the engine stays cool. And if you're hot lapping it, make sure that it does have time to cool down in between right. rounds so you're not. Right. Awesome. Well, Joe, I appreciate you walking yep. me through uh, Very... this build and uh... I'm going to have a chat with Eric here and kind of compare and contrast, uh, you know, the two different six sevens that we just talked about. So Great. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, guys, so both Eric and I just got wrapped up uh, talking with Joe here at Shy Diesel about our different 6.7 Cummins builds. And uh, they're both gonna be pretty awesome, but we're gonna break them down uh, over a couple different categories here and see uh, who ultimately is getting a little bit more bang for the buck, right, Eric? Right, right. So uh, let's start out just recapping horsepower. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your build. You know, how much horsepower was Joe saying you might you know, get we're, we're looking about 500 to 550 horsepower that's okay. all said and done yep. our mild build here yeah and that's pretty solid for what you're going to be doing you know using that as a work truck you know tow truck uh on my side you know i'm looking to be competitive i'm looking to, uh, to race this uh, engine uh and i should be able to get somewhere in that thousand to twelve hundred horsepower range uh depending on a few minor factors so you know obviously you know, getting up to that 1200 horsepower range uh, gives me uh, the horsepower edge over the mild build uh, as can be expected here. Oh so, yeah, yeah, for sure. And so I mean, check mark awesome. to, to a wild build in the first category there. Second, let's move to, you know, sticking with the horsepower. How about dollars per horsepower? Um, Eric, you had a $15,000 budget. You're getting about 550 horsepower. You know, doing that math, you're getting about uh, what's well, costing you about $27 per horsepower on your build. And uh, over on the, the wild side, for me to get 1,200 horsepower and I'm spending $25,000, uh, that came out just under $21 per horsepower. So believe it or not, you know, a little bit more money uh, is actually still a little bit better value in terms of the horsepower, you know, dollars per horsepower goes a little bit goes a little bit longer way so, yeah. so you, you yeah. actually win you win the horsepower but you also win the dollars per horsepower that's right it goes so, a little bit longer way two zero right now for for the wild build uh, but let's talk about durability because i think that's where uh the mild build might come out on top right let's i I, I think so that. absolutely i mean you know part of it of course is a testament to how durable this engine is to start with uh, but you know, we're going through checking all the factory components, machining them as necessary, you know, putting this thing together, uh, you know, upgraded camshaft for the street to give us the performance we need yeah. and some other upgrades. But, you know, we're really not doing anything to affect the durability of this. I mean, this right. thing is a solid bulletproof, even though we're at, you know, that 500 to 550 horsepower and we're going to be working this thing hard, but we know this thing's going to hold together. Yeah. And that's not to say that on the wild side, it's not durable, because it certainly is. You know, I'm getting uh, very similar machine work done. Uh, I'm getting those upgraded components that can handle horsepower. Uh, the simple fact is in competition engine, <laughs> my objective is sort of just to beat the crap out of this thing and really push it to the limits. Uh, and inevitably something could go wrong. Um, again, not to say it's not durable or isn't going to make it through a full season. It's just there's more likelihood that, you know, something might happen. So I think you got to say that the, the mild build is a little bit more durable overall. So check mark there. So we'll take the win on that one. <laughs> All right. And uh, so let's get into the ease of upgrading these engines. You know, we both talked to Joe about going to that next level on the build. Um, talk a little bit about some of the things that you might do on, uh, on your engine to go to the next level. Well, you know, we've got so many opportunities to take this mild build to the next level, even with just fuel system upgrades, you know, intake upgrades, exhaust upgrades, and turbo upgrades, there's a lot we can do mm -hmm. to really crank things up, you know, and, and fairly easily we could even install fire rings on the cylinder head so it can handle more cylinder pressure that we produce if we, you know, crank up the turbo size yeah. and we can really get a lot more out of this engine pretty easily. Yeah, absolutely. And 
you know, there's plenty of things that I can do on the wild side as well, um, both with fuel and with air, you know, the turbo setup. You know, the components are, are in there. You know, they're gonna be kind of made to handle that higher horsepower. Um, but to go from 1200 up to 2000, it's gonna take some significant improvements on the turbo and fuel side. Um, whereas you're gonna get some pretty big improvements from more minor, uh, you know, machine work or simpler uh, upgrades. So I think, again, the mild build is gonna get the ease of upgrading check mark. I think so, absolutely. We'll catch up to you pretty quick. Yeah, so, so that makes it two and two. And our last category is competitiveness. Uh, and again, today it's a little unfair because, you know, Eric's mild build is really not for competition. It's, it's his, you know, work truck uh, tow application, whereas, you know, mine is strictly on the competition side. So uh, the wild build is going to get the check mark there on competitiveness. And uh, that gives the wild build the 3 2 victory uh, today. But again, we hope that you guys enjoyed this episode of Mild vs. Wild. Uh, again, we want to give a big thank you to everyone at Shide Diesel uh, and, and Dan Shide for showing us around the shop today. Make sure you guys are checking out everything that they've got going on. We also want to thank our sponsors, Amsoil and SBI, uh, for helping uh, put this show together. And of course, make sure you guys are checking out enginebuildermag.com for more great engine content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.